Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mike Green, publisher, Search Engine Watch, and Click Z. Good afternoon, welcome back. Um, I, for those of you who were here at the session just before lunch, you probably spotted there was a slight problem with uh, one of the microphones, so I should start with a, uh, an apology for the uh, slight technical problem that I'm having with this microphone. It's an intermittent problem, and for some unknown reason, every now and again, it can make you sound like you have a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> it's doing it now, isn't it? I guarantee the next person to take this microphone will go back to perfect American. Do you know? <laughs> I've been doing that little sketch, that little gaguette all over the world with the conference series that I produce, and the only place that it doesn't work is in London, England. <laughs> On the subject of languages, you know, I was in China uh, recently, a very fascinating place. We have a series of uh, conferences that I produce over there. Um, and they're very clever there. They do the sessions um, in two languages, bilingual. And my wife is always very happy to tell people that I speak two languages fluently, English and rubbish. <laughs> and this session is likely to be a combination of both things. <laughs> Let's see how it goes from here. So um, I want to just quickly introduce our panelists. Fascinating session that we have coming up. These guys are industry experts. Um, I've known these guys for, I don't know, it's going back at least 90 minutes now, and uh, we're getting along very well together. <laughs> I'll probably give them a better uh, opportunity to explain exactly who they are. We have uh, Christine Nimsky, uh, as you can see. We've also got Alan Osetek, and we have Jeremy Sanchez. And nobody knows these guys better than they know themselves, and they'll explain exactly who they are and why they're here in a few minutes. So uh, I, um, I'm writing a third book at the moment. Uh, it's about connected marketing, but a lot of it is about uh, the change in the CMO and the transformation from the CIO and the CMO into this one role. And last year in New York, IBM had a conference. They just called it 90 plus 90. They took 90 CIOs, 90 CMOs, put them into one room and said, duke it out for the next couple of days, guys. And I've got just a little overview of what came out of that conference, which should set us up very nicely for this particular session. It used to be so simple. Marketing drove people to the door, sales closed the deal, and IT added it up. <laughs> right, that was it. Marketing was a one-way street. And then along came the web, and it really changed all of it, because marketing is now a two-way street, and customers are involved and engaged, and they're talking back. You've got this shift in the nature of the customer relationship, and then now, IT is gonna move way out of the back office and into the front office. And when these two things happen at the same time, assertion is it's gonna redefine the role of marketing, and it is going to reimagine the partnership with IT. They want individual experiences, which sounds great, but how many million customers does American Express have? Uh, we've got over 100 million customers. That's a lot of individual <laughs> experiences to try to create. You have to know who the individual person is. This is the ultimate personalization. And knowing the customer, as many people have said, has gone from knowing their demographic to knowing the customer as an individual. And we have lots of data that tells us what customers are saying. It's just a matter of connecting the dots. And using those analytics, using that data to figure out what people are actually doing is, is driving a level of understanding that, that none of us have ever had before. What do they want that they haven't expressed yet? What is not just their next best action, but next possible aspiration? It's not about forcing customers to come to you and doing it your way. It's about meeting their needs as they choose, which I believe ultimately strengthens our connections with customers because we're then more relevant to the way that they live their life. Knowing what they're most interested in, and when and where we need to be able to deliver that is what we're learning. So what is our best antidote? Jenny said it well, to build authentically great companies and therefore build great brands. 
Customers are gonna know as much about you as you know about them. Because when they pick up a product, they're gonna know not only everything about the product, everything that's been said about it, but everything about you and your suppliers. If technology does not in a meaningful way influence the customer experience of the brand, then it is redundant. And if the authentic point of view of the brand is not meaningfully designed into every part of the experience, then the experience will have failed. So we can see the CMO and the CIO as co-designers of experience. Let's tear down that wall between marketing and IT. If you bring those two folks together, and that mindset, not just the people, then we'll make a change. When you build a system of engagement that does more than deliver promotions at the right time, but that delivers value to an individual, you know, that's very different. You can't fake a smile like this. Has there ever been a time in business where technology mattered more? It will allow us to grow even more and ultimately strengthen these connections for the benefit of everyone. All right, guys, moving on. Interesting conversation. Please welcome Christine Nemsky. Thank you. Hi. Can you guys hear me OK? No British accent? OK, this is the correct microphone. Um, so I run digital for Consumer Reports, and it's actually kind of a new role. Uh, many of you probably know us as a magazine publisher. We've been doing that for a long time. We actually have been around since, oh, the 30s. And our organization was built actually as a response to the Mad Men. We were created as a nonprofit, independent voice that was only monetizing consumers paying us for information. And the main value that we deliver is to help consumers understand the products and services that they're buying. And so we've had this long history. And it's been kind of fun. I am actually relatively new to the organization. Uh, as I mentioned, the organization finally said, whoa, there's this thing called digital. We should have a guy to worry about that. So that's me. And about Consumer Reports, uh, for those of you that don't know, we have the magazine, we have websites, uh, we also have another magazine that's more of a lifestyle thing called Shop Smart, and we also have a more edgy website called Consumerist that we actually bought from Gawker Media in 2009. And so what I wanted to share with you today is a little bit of an experiment that we did, which for us is very different. Typically, we've historically been a old school earned media company. What do I mean by that? Well, we've really focused on magazine covers, interviews with experts, putting people on the Today Show, uh, breaking big issues and doing press releases. None of the stuff that you guys typically talk about in here. And so I came into the organization, a little bit of a diagnostic phase, and just said, hey, let's give people permission to do the kind of experimentation that we do in our labs with media, the only requirement being just measure stuff and socialize within the organization. So I'm going to give you one example today. Uh, we test a lot of things. We do washers, wine, actually do toilets, although I'm not going to talk about whether we have <laughs> iPad friendliness in the testing protocol. We actually do not right now. Build it in. Um, so that's probably a safer thing for everybody, actually. Uh, and then in terms of uh, what we also test, we also test cars. And I apologize, the graphic didn't really come out well here. We have a 300-acre uh, test track in Connecticut. And we're known for testing cars. Uh, a lot of our attention that we get in an earned media and kind of mindset comes from our reliability issue of the magazine and the automotive issue that typically comes out in April. And just to give you a little bit of sense of the footprint, uh, we have a lot of external earned media. Uh, a lot of that's digital, but a lot of it's also offline. And so a car came along that is pretty popular right now. It's the Tesla Model S. And we actually ran it through our testing protocol, and it actually outscored any other car that we ever tested, including some pretty strong cars that people typically love to be enthusiastic about, like BMW's M5 and a bunch of other vehicles. And so we thought, wow, this is kind of an interesting moment. Uh, this, is, this is actually something that we should try and experiment a little bit and play with. So we did. And I wanted to just share with you the areas that we played with. Uh, some of this will be old hat to you guys. But if you go back to Abe's presentation where he talked about the sort of continuum of where larger companies are in their use of social media, earned media, and other types of methods uh, more digital, we're like on step one. So this is an adventure for us. And so we experimented with 
dramatic flair, doing something very unexpected from a brand like us, because we're not exactly known as the really cool, edgy, crazy guys, uh, and timing and optimization while we were going. So first one, dramatic flair. I'm going to just focus you on the headlines. If you're really into this stuff, you can read the rest of it. Um, we typically never have a headline like that, ever. We do not like to be so final and so declarative because we have 200 engineers, literally engineers in our organization. So if we rate TVs, we go hire a guy from like Samsung or Philips who makes TVs. That's how we approach this stuff. Uh, we buy all the things ourselves. And so typically, you have an engineer mindset that doesn't want to make a lot of real aggressive media statements because you never know. There might be another one. There might be one that's better. So we came out and said, hey, we're going to do something really bold, and we're going to say it's the top scoring car ever. We did. This generated a massive amount of uptake, uh, largely from Reddit, but also through MSN and Yahoo, where we have syndication uh, arrangements in place. And that drove a huge, huge traffic spike. And I'll actually show you some downstream effects of that uh, later. The other thing we did, and this is probably the more creative part of Consumer Reports, is we typically have, if you've ever watched any of our videos, we have a guy in a blue lab coat talking, sometimes to another guy, uh, about the products, about the testing they did. They're about four to seven minutes long. They're not terribly engaging. And so we actually created a video that we pre-released, and I'll show you a timeline in a second to show you how we staged it, that was just us drifting the car. Not a word said, not anything like that. Um, no talking people in blue jackets. And what we found is that a lot of enthusiast publications, people that typically don't think of us as kind of a fun, racy car culture, actually picked up on it. And this little green box here shows the reaction that a lot of them had, uh, which is from Consumer Reports. These guys actually can drift. They actually know how to drive a stick shift car. They do something more than minivans. Uh, and that was really cool. And it actually, as we watched the media propagate out, it was starting to pop up in places a little bit atypical of where we get mentioned. We usually get a lot of play in places like the Wall Street Journal, not so much in uh, Autoblog or Jalopnik or places like that. So that was kind of a neat brand expanding uh, effect of, of what we did. And in terms of timing, um, this is a slightly different slide than uh, than I had before. But basically, we had uh, some staging that we did. Tesla had a quarterly report that came out, I believe, on May 8th. And so we dropped the drifting video right in front of it. And then we um, started following up with, with our normal ratings and a fuller video kind of going through the car in detail. And what we saw is that a lot of the organizations that were covering the ratings report, which is a very highly anticipated rating re report, people like CNN Money, Motley Fool, Bloomberg, et cetera, associated us and started actually calling us out and giving us links in their coverage of the earning report. So the net effect there is well-timed. You can actually surf. We had the picture of the surfing with the dolphin earlier. You can actually surf that wave really well. And that generated huge, huge surfing uptake for us in terms of getting picked up by the financial circuit. So first you have the enthusiast circuit, then you have the financial circuit. Uh, so that was pretty exciting. And in terms of net effect, just to, I mean, y'all can read, so I'm not going to read the numbers off of, off of this, but basically it is the strongest month we've ever had in terms of earned media ever. And uh, that one car, that one article basically carried an equivalent amount of engagement to an entire normal month of uh, earned media. And from a standpoint of a CMO type uh, view, this was really interesting, and we did not really coordinate it. We did not do the t top down or hub spoke type of coordination. We just gave people experiment permission, uh, the ability to experiment. Last thing I wanted to share is that we optimized during the day. And this is something that was a little counterintuitive to us. We're used to the big media drop, where literally you have your embargo date, you clear your date, you launch the magazine, you put your media up on the iPad, the replica editions on Kindle and other things, your website, you just stand back and go, wow, that's really cool. Watch all these people read this stuff. We actually had a team optimizing during the day the links in the article. Like many publishers, we have a template system. A lot of the links are fairly standard. If you have a Tesla S, you put up links to alternative fuel buying guides and things of that nature. We actually watched during the day, saw what people are engaging with, played with it. Within the span of 24 hours, we're able to increase what we care about, which is a browse further rate. We're not a lead gen company. We're not an ad company. So we care about just pulling our subscribers in and engaging them and non-subscribers to engage them as well. So 
kind of net out on all of this is uh, these are very simple lessons, which is if you use dramatic flare in your headlines, it matters. Uh, and it not only increases the grab and the initial read, but also the click through downstream. We actually saw that when we changed some of the headlines, whether it's in the article or on the title of the video, it actually increased downstream clicks, uh, click throughs. So some of our car pricing services and other things that we monetize directly actually saw a lot of lift from that. Doing the unexpected expands how people view your brand and gets you in front of different audiences. Timing the media cycles, as I talked about earlier, was important. And then you can actually optimize within the media cycle. You don't have to watch the whole thing go down and then just sit back and think. You can work while you're there. Um, so anyways, that's it. Real simple thing. So thank you for having me here at Share 13. This is my first one. Seems like a great conference. And I'm going to pass you now to Alan Ossetek, who will uh, we'll keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, start out with a quote. So um, I know we've heard all morning, um, and, it, and actually I'm really happy that Bright Edge chose this as, a, um, as one of the themes for the conference because um, I really truly feel that it's finally, we're finally here. I know we've heard before people still talking, and even this quote talks about kind of a futuristic state in 2015, what's going to happen. Well, um, it's actually happening right now, and it's happening very quickly. Um, a good friend of mine about 12 months ago, kind of as a as a side business, it's not his full-time job, um, bought the uh, URL um, chiefdigitalofficer.net, and he basically, um, kind of on the side, he started kind of a, a trade um, title publication related to the CDO, or Chief Digital Officer. So um, he, uh, he, almost every day now, because he's, he's almost, he's flabbergasted how many people are signing up for his, his Twitter handle and is you know, connected to him on Facebook now, um, Almost every day, he forwards me over an email with some Fortune 500 company who just you know, started the new CDO title, uh, hired a person for it. And um, if you look at, so there's the digital CMO, but I also think that like right now what's happening is to bridge the gap before all CMOs become highly digital, you know, there is a CDO type title that is kind of working with the CMO um, as we're moving towards all, you know, kind of the all-encompassing digital CMO. Um, What's also interesting about this is this morning, um, I was researching this, and uh, uh, Jim, uh, you, I don't know if he's in here or not, he wrote it really, if you Google um, this quote in Jim's name, he wrote a really interesting article about this in the Huffington Post recently, so I encourage everyone to read it. So, um, you know, but in terms of where the CMO is uh, today, uh, from where they, they've come from where they are today, you know, I started in digital way back in 98. I think even as late as 2005, 2006, uh, with the brands we were working with, most CMOs were still um, either, you know, kind of ex-creative TV folks or, you know, kind of ex-like offline media TV people as well, where I think we're really starting to get like kind of that first wave of CMOs that is really happening today or, or CDOs that uh, come from a digital background, have both a left brain, right brain, uh, creative and um, analytic type background. So I think it's a really interesting times. So um, before kind of I get into my, uh, this is my one slide on who I am, what I do, Alan Ostek, uh, pres Global President of Resolution. Resolution is the search and social unit for Omnicom Media Group. We have about 600 people globally doing search and social, about 250 people in North America. Uh, interestingly enough, it's interesting times for Omnicom right now because it was just announced that Omnicom is going to potentially merge in the next few months with Publicis uh, pending regulatory approvals. Uh, so you basically have two of the larger holding companies coming together, which will account for about 40% of all advertising bought globally. So that'll be interesting. So, uh, but the reason I put this slide up, one of the reasons I show these brands is because um, what I want to talk to you about um, today in the next few minutes is a, um, a platform we've developed in the last couple of years called ClearTarget. It's basically a persona development product. I'm going to talk a little bit about it, show it, an example. Um, and the reason I thought it would be interesting to show you is because what we find across the brands we're talking to today, what really resonates at the, you know, the higher levels of these organizations, the digital CMO, the CDOs, is this product clear target. And it's mainly because it, um, it's essentially, it's, a, it's an SEO persona development product, but it actually ties really nicely into the overall media, media planning process across all channels. And whether you're kind of what, what we call maybe an old school CMO from traditional media or you're the new digital CMO, you know, both types of CMOs and, and VPs of marketing actually understand the platform and it helps them take SEO um, and, um, and kind of tie it together with their entire media planning process. Um, it actually helps them 
develop personas as well, which we'll get into. Um, so I thought it would be an interesting thing to talk about. So essentially, you know, I kind of already mentioned what it is. It's, it's essentially a platform for doing you know, kind of audience segmentation, persona development. And uh, it was something that was uh, an idea uh, from a few of our folks internally, uh, one of uh, whom is here today, Dave McAnelly, who I think speaks later on this afternoon. So um, you know, I encourage you all to talk to him about it. Um, and just to, you know, to, to talk about the personas, I think what, you know, going back to the digital CMO, what's most interesting about it is the way that traditional media uh, was, was planned and, and then bought is um, you took whatever, especially historically, you took whatever data was available, and certainly there's a lot more data available today to, to do the planning and the comms planning process, but you know, it's still part art, part science, because we're living in an imperfect world where not everything is digital yet. So, you know, in the traditional media planning process, you build personas and audiences, and then you go out and you buy against those audiences. Well, um, you know, within SEO, it's actually just the opposite, because what we're doing is we're taking, you know, SEO and other types of data, which I'll show you in a second, and we're building personas not based on who we believe the target audience is, but who's searching on us right now. And, um, and as we've, we've done this why, this, why the CMOs like it is because we find personas or audiences that they didn't know existed for their brand, and they're starting to use this platform to inform not only their search in their digital buys, but even kind of changing their, the communications process for how they buy offline. So, you know, kind of a real, real simple high-level architecture. What we're doing is really taking a variety of different search and other data sets. And uh, oh, the other, I probably should have mentioned this up front, the other thing that's interesting is as we, we get into segmentation analysis and sort, sort weighting and audience indexing and things like that, we're actually using this platform in conjunction with Bright Edge. So um, and we'll, we'll see that a little bit in, a, um, in an example, uh, to, to leave an output of different profile valuations. And uh, this can be done uh, not only for you know, kind of North American uh, brands, but also global. So you know, using, um, using an example, okay, so we have, here's an example of a persona. It's uh, Florian. He's a 20-year-old, 22-year-old student. He uh, likes his mobile devices, and you know, effectively what we're doing for him is we're, we're basically, um, and by the way, this is actually a real client case study. It's uh, one of our large uh, global uh, software uh, clients. And uh, this particular example is um, uh, a persona that we developed for uh, the client in Germany. So you know, effectively what we're doing by taking all these different data sources, we're, we're building a profile of what this persona looks like, a person that we're going to target from an SEO perspective, and, and quite honestly, not only from an SEO, but from a digital and offline perspective. And we're essentially, uh, we, we basically then map that against uh, different pinnacle keywords, keyword categories, insights, looking at your typical um, volumes across those rankings. And then, you know, for those of you who use Bridge, probably, you know, seeing some graphs that look pretty familiar, we're basically um, then profiling and building an SEO action plan against him. So, you know, in this particular example, it, this, is, um, this is one particular, particular persona, typically uh, for any one product within a brand set, we're developing, you know, maybe three or four broad category personas, or in some instances, we're going more uh, from a segmented perspective and going deeper into, the, into this process. And again, like, you know, I'm pointing this out in the context of, of uh, the digital CMO because when we show, it, sometimes, it, you know, as we all know, you know we, either on the agency side or the brand side, sometimes it's been difficult historically to take SEO as a practice and integrate it into the overall marketing mix. So when you're having an internal agency meeting or you're, you're on the brand side and you're trying to explain what's going on within the, the SEO world to other marketers within the organization, you know, the mindset and trying to get everyone into the mindset of, how you incorporate SEO into, into the media planning process by, by taking this type of approach. It's something that your traditional media planners as well as your, your, uh, your, your newer digital media planners can understand and, and, and um, you know, kind of get their head around and absorb this type of thing. So um, you know, obviously, I think the end result from th this particular German case study was, was very positive. We saw a great lift in the overall results of the campaign. And I'll leave you with, um, you know, whether it be a platform like ours, like ClearTarget, or um, you know, any, any other platform like this in the marketplace, I think you know, the, the, um, the most important thing I can leave you with is you know, as, we, as, as you're using Bright Edge, as you're using platforms or persona development pro, uh, platforms like the one I just showed you, you know, 
think about how you can better visualize and build a planning process that ties into media because while the CDO and the digital CMO exist today, I think it's still going to be a few years before um, you know, everyone really understands the value of what SEO brings to the table. And by putting things in terms that all media people can understand, and by building platforms and visualization techniques like this, uh, it really helps SEO have even more power and a bigger seat at the table within the, um, the advertising uh, community or within the marketing departments. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jeremy Sanchez, uh, CEO of Global Strategies. We're part of uh, the Ogilvy Group. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about and I'm kind of passionate about, and I'm, I've been in the industry for 17 years, and that means, yes, I'm over 40, and I'm probably one of 50 people that are over 40 in this room. Um, and, and really, what I, I became passionate about is when I started in this space, I was actually um, working, to help, working with P&G to help set up a search service line. And, uh, and really what the goal was is how do we actually um, enable the enterprise knowing that there's, they're, they're big and it's challenged and we all work in a horizontal capability when enterprises are vertically oriented. And we talked a lot about that today. And so I kind of have a picture of this elephant because one of the things that I think that's happening is we're talking a lot about technology, um, which is good, um, but we're not talking enough about what needs to happen to realize the value of technology. And that's really this idea of change management that we started to talk about. So I was, uh, I'm gonna basically give you kind of five insights that we're seeing in the marketplace from different customers. Uh, hopefully something you can take back uh, tomorrow and, and, and see what you can action. But it's really more of sharing what we see as challenges that our customers are facing and, and op areas of opportunity. Um, this kind of plays on what Mike was showing earlier around the IBM and the CMO study. The average tenure of a CMO today is 43 months. That's up from 26 months uh, in the year 2006. So 26 months. They're in the job for two years, just over two years. So what, what's happening? Why is the tenure up? Um, why is it basically, you know, it's roughly doubled. And I think it's a lot of these companies where their business model has been challenged by the web, uh, they realize that digital, they need to be more patient. And if you look at what, what you know, really a summary of uh, some of the things that were actually in that video that Mike showed, tool implementation issues. How many of you, by raise of hands, feel like you have enough resources on your team to do the job? Wow. Nobody raised their hand, by the way, for these people in the front. Um, oh, one person, okay. Um, are you the CEO? <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Um, and you see there's an issue with costs, lack of skills, so competencies, it's interesting, Jim's, yeah, there's 25,000 open positions in the industry right now. Um, we, there, there's a big opportunity that search and, and the competencies are not, being, are not being brought in from the top. Uh, I feel this industry has been sort of, a, it's been fighting its way bottom up. It's a fish upstream. And what I kind of want to show is, uh, is sort of, you know, five areas where, you know, I think that we're seeing an impact if you can address them. But obviously here the lack of uh, marketing and IT alignment is, is a big area. And I think this is only going to become a bigger issue. Um, if you look at the acquisition strategies of a Salesforce or an Adobe, um, what, what you're really seeing is, is they're basically creating walled gardens. They're creating, they're creating um, areas where they're, they're platforms that are addressing everything from um, uh, acquisition through retention with the goal of one of the, one of the areas that we talked a lot about is attribution is a real issue for, for us as an industry. Well, that's one way to solve that problem is keep customers in your technology stack. Um, and, and I think if we don't actually look at what do we need to do from an organization, so any of you C-suites um, here, what I would say is it's going to be up to you uh, to drive the change. And it's probably mostly it's intangible and it relates to culture. Um, how do you drive a culture of change? Something I think uh, Dave mentioned around Google and being more agile is it's, it's really, it's, we're talking about a cultural change. So here's some of the opportunities and challenges we're seeing across our customers. One is articulating the value of search or digital to the CMO. 
is there, we don't have a really clear way in our industry right now that we're articulating value. Um, we're doing it something through, you know, um, through revenue, it's an easier, but um, a lot of the big companies sell through channels and it's harder to track revenue. Um, measuring the collateral impact of search. We undervalue search and we get the question a lot, and I don't know how many of you have gotten this question, is if we did nothing, wouldn't we still continue to see organic search on the rise? If you look at your log files, most every one of you probably see your, your log files kind of going up year over year, and, and you don't know what's necessarily driving that change. We see that across all of our customers because I believe that is, is that the demand continues to grow. But what happens when demand stabilizes? Um, we need a new way to measure, and I think uh, talking about sort of moving to this asset-based approach, or landing page approach, is, is a big move. Demonstrating innovation and big ideas. Um, I was going to take you through an example of what Ford's doing. And then how do you deal with uh, getting insights that you get from uh, your SEO teams? And how many of you, uh, you know, I think somebody mentioned earlier this morning, uh, you know, this battle between, you know, getting a title tag implemented with IT resources. This is, this is a fight. This is a real thing that's happening. And there's a way that uh, one of our customers is dealing with that right now. And then hi, lastly is search hasn't been very sexy. Uh, it's an industry that's kind of a yawn at times. Um, and what are some new things that we could be doing uh, to get executives excited? And one of the things that a lot of our customers are doing is beginning to shoot video um, to, and, and show process and, and, and educating uh, teams that way. So I'm going to talk about the first one. How many of you, by the show of hands, know what your CMO is measuring? 10% of you. One of the things that we've learned to make an impact is you must go and find out what, how your CMO is measuring uh, the, the, the value of their programs. And in this case, this is actually a financial client. The paid owned earned model is, is, uh, is, is a very popular one and, and for good reason. And what you'll see here is you're seeing paid earned and owned being uh, measured together and you're seeing a cost per conversion and a total marketing spend and so you're seeing how one affects the other, but it's captured in one area. And you'll see, um, in this case, cost per conversion um, has actually been staying consistent as the other media types change. But I think one of the, the, the key takeaways is you must know what your CMO is measuring. Um, it, we just can't move that change needle until that happens. One of the things that, that was talked about this morning is we need to move to an asset-based approach in terms of looking at value. And the way our industry has been is it's really been a, uh, and most of the technologies are set up to where it's keyword and it's mapped to some sort of asset. And this is where our industry is at now is uh, natural direct views from a target keyword. That's how we measure. Then we have another area where we believe it needs to be expanded to tell a full true story is natural direct views from keyword unavailable. So we're seeing those increasing. Natural direct views, other keywords, and natural direct views from other pages within the site. In total, what you're seeing is, is there's a much bigger impact that's happening. Um, and it was really pleased to see the Bright Edge uh, launch this capability because it's going to tell a, a, a fuller, um, uh, richer story in terms of what actually the impact of search is having on the business. The other area is around innovation. One thing that uh, this is a, a car company, this is Ford. And what Ford has done, um, and I think it's pretty innovative, is they're working with their corporate communications We've been talking a lot about content, and, and the beauty of what search, what we have in this industry, is it's not only a channel, but it's also an insights tool. And what they're doing is, is they're mining real-time queries, uh, similar to something that uh, Alan mentioned, is and what they've done is, everybody here has used Google Trends. How many people use Google Trends? Well, the power of Google Trends, though, is if you access it through the API, it actually will give you eight years of historical search data. Um, which is really powerful. And so that's one of the key takeaways, I would say, as, is what you can do is go back and use Google Trends and leverage it for eight years of historical data. And what you're seeing here, and this is what uh, Ford is doing, is they've categorized their keyword landscapes into different key groups around, you'll see these pillars here, around fuel, um, you see um, miles per gallon, and other things. They, they think that green is the way, but what they're really finding through this approach is that the discussion is still around fuel. Um, and this is a very simple way to get the CMO or the digital CMO excited about 
where additional share may exist. They're thinking, CMOs are thinking from a share perspective. How do we gain more share? Um, and, so, and what it's also given is the corporate uh, communications team a tool to actually push um, relevant content out, um, knowing that it's something they actually call their ideation engine. Um, how do we continue to ideate on a regular daily basis? This is just a simple dashboard that they're using to do that. Lastly, um, one area how we actually, you know, it's been discussed a lot in the past that the, the web is a, the, the great equalizer. You know, small companies compete with big companies. Um, it's not true if, if companies actually, big companies coordinate uh, the assets that they have. And in this case, what's happening with, uh, this, is, uh, this is actually Perina and their brands, is they're recognizing that brands need to break down those walls and actually work together to realize the value. And what you're seeing here is a matrix, um, something that they're referring to as a playbook. They're developing a playbook for key verticals that they want to be in and understanding how are they going to map their brands to that. Um, and so in this case, what they have here is they develop tip verticals They've assigned which brand, which website will actually go after those verticals, and how will they effectively vote for each other? Um, you know, the, the search is a game of authority and relevance. This is one way that they're doing that is by actually bringing relevance um, through sort of a matrix playbook model. And what it's really forcing them to have to do is get, their, it's, they're consolidating agencies to where they have to take a lead agency around content creation, and then, um, and then, they're, then they're basically putting brand governance uh, in place uh, to dictate that. Kind of the last piece, and what we're seeing is there's four major areas companies need to focus on to realize this value and, and sort of you know, focus on this change management. And I think it was talked a little bit about governance, but we see standards and processes are, are critical. Um, where are search inputs in, uh, with, with across the organization? Audit your workflow. Uh, it needs to be there. This is one area you can attack. People and organization. One of the areas that we've attacked in using HR as a tool is we will actually go ahead and actually um, search becomes a key part of the evaluation in their performance. Um, and that's for brand managers, product owners. That's critical to drive the change. You can't underestimate education and evangelism or across the organization. Um, the, the leading companies out there are hosting search only marketing and, uh, expos in their, in their companies. Um, this is ongoing. And, and that's really sort of how efficiently they're working with it. And then lastly is the tools. What we see a lot of times is uh, tools are put into place, but there's no resources around it. And um, I feel like if we can get over that hump and actually inform and, and uh, help build the business case with our executives, that's what's going to push us over and drive that incremental value that we, we all think that uh, it can provide. That's all I had, and uh, we'll move over to questions. Thanks.